Well, Thomas, thanks uh, so much for taking the time and, uh, and for joining me today. Yeah, hi, no problem, Andrew. Yeah, no, it's great. Uh, certainly interesting and unique times <laughs> that we're having this conversation. And uh, uh, I know we, we had a chance to speak a little bit uh, kind of prior to this conversation. And we're going to spend a bit of time today kind of digging into care or the details. And um, both, I'd love to talk to you about time as a player and then kind of everything that you're doing right now. Um, and maybe to start, uh, it'd be interesting to give you a chance to kind of look back and think when, how was kind of your quality of care in the development of your, your game and kind of how were your details? We have all your stats, so we know, I did with Digging, you landed right on 500 professional appearances, which is interesting. I don't know if you planned it. Um, 190 goals and, and we can get to, at the Premier League with the Everton and Fulham and, and obviously the great stretch you had at Anderlecht. So, Kind of as you were developing as a player, like how were your, how were your habits? How was your care? How were your details as you, as you think back? Well, let's, uh, let's put it this way. I think the, the, the care and the habits, they have changed over the years. Um, but, uh, it, well, for me, it wasn't really easy. I mean, uh, it, basically when, when growing up in, in, in Poland uh, in the first place and then moving from one country to another, um, I have developed a taste for different kinds of cultures and different kind of um, soccer development, um, which might have helped me in, uh, in 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 the future in a career afterwards. But you know, starting starting your um, your career in Canada as a professional at the age of uh, seventeen and, and, and then a few months, it wasn't really easy. Um, you know, the infrastructure was really. Um, uh, basic at best at that time, you know, a stadium at North, Ro uh, North York in Toronto um, at the CSL um, was, uh, I'm guessing, two and a half thousand um, people could get in and it was all on stilts. Yeah. Um, so it was just, um, you know, from, for me, from my perspective, it was really, uh, uh, I, I didn't care because the only thing I wanted to do is play, uh, play soccer and, and, and play as high as possible. So the starting moments of my career in Canada were, although maybe not at uh, the level I got used to later on in my career, but it was something that I could take with me and, 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 and cherish that not everything um, is easy and that not everything is given to you on a silver platter. You have to work for it mm. to actually get there. So um, that was, um, was interesting, but uh, you know, at the, uh, at the age of 19, I finally, um, uh, got the guts and made a move to uh, to to move to Europe and try my luck in Europe because uh, um, staying in Canada and the CSL at that time was not really an option. The uh, the league was not uh, doing so well. The league was um, struggling financially. Um, There's only uh, six or eight teams at best um, mm -hmm. scattered all over Canada, and obviously with a fan base of about two thousand people per team, it was quite difficult to to sustain it over the years. Yeah. So uh, the nice uh, training facilities from Toronto FC right now, or from Montreal Impact, or from Vancouver. I mean, uh, yeah. we could have only dreamt of something like this right now, and it's 25 years later, and those guys have really everything that they can dream of, and uh, and rightfully so, really, because uh, Canada has a great, um, great uh, soccer background, and there's so many young kids who are playing the game, and. And I think if they want to uh, achieve anything, they have to look into the Canadian League right now and just just see uh, that it can be done, and you know, just follow the dream in uh, that direction. Yeah, and, and the opportunities are op obviously opening up with the new professional league in Canada. And obviously, like you said, when you played, like very few players, young players, were making out of the CSL and going to Europe and being able to build a career. Um, kind of thinking back to your time on the training ground, to the other players that you're competing against, like what do you think, what was the difference maker? Why, why did you get an opportunity? What allowed you a chance to stand out and, and get a chance to go abroad? I think it's the guts too. I mean, uh, I know lots of kids right now, even in Canada, who are very comfortable on, uh, in actually staying in Canada and not trying to pursue, uh, pursue the, uh, the opportunities that are in Europe, you know? Mm -hmm. um, they, they have three professional teams right now in Canada in the MLS uh, mm -hmm. and they, uh, you know, they think if I can make it over here, why move abroad? Uh, you know, miss all your friends, miss the family, um, uh, try to follow a different life. Uh, I, I think it's going to be uh, one of those things where in 1994, the year I actually moved to, uh, to Europe, I had a different set um, mindset 
and I wanted to go back to Europe. I, I needed to go back to Europe because I knew if I'd stayed in Canada and, and tried to develop my career over there, it probably would have gotten me nowhere at that time. Um, the league was just not strong enough. The, uh, the image of Canadian football was, um, was also not really um, highly rated at that time. So uh, if I needed and wanted to do something with my life, with my career, the, the obvious step for me was just go back to Europe and try. So yeah. uh, second division in Belgium was the first uh, step of my, uh, of my tryouts. And, uh, and although it was only second division, they have not decided to sign me. Mm -hmm. um, circumstantial probably, but it was um, a little bit lucky for me as well that uh, at that time there were other teams scouting and, uh, and after only having a one training session with the Premier League, first, uh, first league team in Belgium, they've decided to give me a one-year deal um, and see how I further will develop. And uh, Well, I would say the rest is history. Yeah. And then when you did land that first time, like what, um, stepping onto the training ground, competing with, you know, now mature professionals from all over the world, like what, what did you see that you're like, wow, I need to catch up on this or I can't believe that the level of professionalism around this element of the game, whether off the field or on the field, like what was the big eye opener for you? Well, the big eye opener was definitely the amount of training that they have done. I mean, we, uh, we trained three times a week in the evenings and uh, we had a game uh, uh, on, well, once every weekend, sometimes once every two weekends. Uh, where in Belgium, in German Alekeren, we had uh, eight times training a week. So uh, a mm. couple of double sessions, uh, only one day off, uh, plus the game every weekend. So right. I've gained about... Uh, 10 kilograms, uh, let's say that would be 20 pounds plus of, uh, of spear, of, of, uh, of muscle, um, just because of the intensity of training. So um, it actually helped me sustain my, uh, my game a little bit longer. You know, the, the problem was with my first year, I got really lots of injuries because of that. I mean, my body right. was not ready to, uh, to gain so much uh, muscle in, in such a short time. And uh, let's say from the first season, I was three to four months um, injured, which was a big, mm. yeah, uh, it was a big problem for the uh, for the decision makers at the uh, at the club who uh, said, well, if he's going to be injured every year for three to four months, they didn't really want to take the risk, so um, to give me another deal, and I was really uh, uh, on the last possible day that. Uh, They've extended my deal for three years um, by some private sponsor who was uh, was uh, willing to uh, to bet uh, that it will you know it will come. Um, everything is going to be just all right. So, uh, mm. uh, like I said, you 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 need to, you need to have the guts. You need to have a little bit of luck in your career, and then you need to sure. be persuasive and, and and just do do whatever you do best, do it better. And do whatever you are struggling with. Uh, train on it as hard as you can to actually improve it. So, and then, and then you'll be just fine. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're right. Like everything, trying when we're working with young players too, trying to help them see that how much of it is luck and timing. It doesn't mean that everything doesn't need to be happening at an incredibly high level behind the scenes. But you know, you need to kind of continue to do that work. So when that luck or that moment comes, you're ready for it. And maybe. I want to dig into some of the stuff you're doing now, but maybe before we jump over, I was interested in like of all the players you had played with, um, you know, if you think back, is there one or two that really stand out around kind of their attention to details and the care that they took in their game and their approach that, um, that was kind of a real good model for you and, and kind of what made them special? Well, there's, there's going to be, um, well, there's going to be three players actually, uh, um, and I met all of those players in the same team at Everton. Um, mm. One of them would be Paul Gascoigne. Mm. Uh, it's, um, it was incredible just to see uh, the quality on this guy. You know, we, we all know Paul Gascoigne's problem with alcohol and, uh, and, uh, and going from rehab to back to football. And, you know, he just needed somebody to give him another chance again and... and uh, Walter Smith at Everton, he gave him that chance. And seriously, um, the, uh, the amount of skills on that guy and, and, and the brains behind those skills, because you have to think of something 
first to be able to execute it. Mm -hmm. And what Paul Gascoigne uh, knew how to do is just uh, whatever he thought of, he could execute it. And you don't see many, uh, many talents like this. And I don't think you can, you can, you can teach somebody this. I think this is just in you, in your blood. So it's one of those um, examples where I would say some things, no matter how much you're going to train for, you will not be able to, to acquire that skill because it's in you, it's in your blood, it's in your, it's in your life, it's in your passion. Um, the second one that I would, uh, I would think is, would be the young Wayne Rooney at the age of 16. He came and started to train with us and um, from a perspective of, uh, well, not looking like a 16 year old uh, boy uh, physically in the first uh, instance well the second instance would be he didn't really look like a 16 year old boy who uh, who plays uh, soccer he, he looked very mature he was very mature at training and uh, and his skill level was uh, uh, above and beyond anything i've seen at that age um in in my career until that time so um again whether or not it was a combination of him growing up in liverpool in a poor area um mm. of the city and actually having a mindset that if I'm not if I'm not going to make it in football then uh, in soccer then I might not make it anywhere else um, and that's why he was uh, striving for perfection and that's why he became so good uh, not mm -hmm. only for club but also for country. Yeah. And then number three was um, was an American was Brian McBride, um, mm. the captain of um, the captain of the American team. And I think I believe he's right now the. Uh, national head coach as well for the US. Um, this, was, uh, this was a guy who would be uh, training about, uh, not only his training session uh, at the club, but he would be staying afterwards doing his, uh, uh, his gym work, his core stability work, his, uh, his massages. He would be, let's say there, like a nine to five job. He would, end, he would start the day around 8.30 in the morning at the club and he would, he would be the first one to arrive. And he would be the last one to leave. So he was taking care of his body so well that uh, you know he uh, he was almost never injured. He uh, was always available for the for the coach to uh, to take him, uh, you know, to, to to put him in the team. And uh, I've never seen a better, more professional guy than than, than Brian McBride. And uh, um, I followed we I, well, I followed Brian to Fulham at the end uh, as well. Yeah. And the older Brian got, the more he worked uh, uh, on his uh, on his body and his uh, his routines for the game, and which got me thinking as well. I mean, you, as a footballer, you learn every day, and uh, and only then, at the age of around thirty plus, I started to become a more professional. Uh, player myself and started to go into the gym more often and did more stretching and did more core stabilities and you know the injury prevention programs that uh, that you're getting at the, at the clubs I've done it on my own work as well um, where uh, in my younger years I was doing it probably not enough um, yeah. so the older I got the older I got and the, the, the less injury prone I was so uh, I think uh, if you look at the at the stats up up till the age of thirty, I was injured a lot, mm. and above the age of thirty, uh, almost until the end of my career, until until I was almost forty, I uh, I almost had no injuries at all. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it was uh, it was very interesting. It was it was nice to learn from uh, and, and and play alongside guys like this because they they also can shape your career. Yeah, well, it's, and it's fascinating. It's obviously three very, very different characters and how they might be viewed as from a fan or a coach from afar. Because um, it's interesting. I think uh, Rooney as an example and kind of going back to David Beckham when he came to the MLS and so people kind of from a North American audience, there was always this sense that Rooney and Beckham and those guys are these natural talents and they were just special players. And then hearing and talking to guys after they arrived, whether Rooney at DC or or Beckham at LA to find out how good their habits were and how hard they worked and that they weren't these just special talents, but they were to your point in the same way you talk about Brian McBride, like they really put the work in. Um, and it's interesting to hear about uh, what you're saying about Brian McBride and, and we'll get in a little bit later. Cause I think the game has evolved so much physically that now everybody is at the highest level. And now it's those little things that make, even more so probably the difference because the game is so much faster. The players are so much stronger. And um, are you seeing, is there any, maybe just on that, is there like 
are there any gaps now in where players are physically and whether young players that you guys are working with are making it or not making it, does it have very much to do with where they are physically or is it more with everything else in their head and how they think the game and their habits? No, it's, def it's definitely physical. I mean, uh, at this moment, uh, well, I'm going to take you back again. Um, my my first years of the Premier League, which was in in, in the early in, in the early two thousands, where um, everybody knew that I was lightning fast and and that I I uh, I could really outrun pretty much uh, anybody on the on, on the football pitch at um, at that time. Um, and getting to the Premier League, they had loads and loads of um, um, strong, big, um, lumpy. Uh, defenders, mm. you know, they they needed to be strong and big, and that was the quality at that time of the Premier League. You know, the two centre backs and probably the number nine striker were big, tall, strong players. What they lacked at that time, um, uh, talking about twenty years ago, uh, mm. is the ability to move, the uh, the ability to turn, and the ability to sprint from from a standing position. You know. And uh, uh, fast forward 10 to 15 years later, when you see somebody as big as Vincent Company, who is, uh, let's say, six, uh, four, six, five, and uh, I would have a hard time in, in, in my best time to actually keep, well, he, he, I would not leave him for dead. He would still be right. running with me, with, you know, with the fastest guys on a pitch right now. They can, they can turn, they can, they can run with them. Uh, without actually looking like somebody is very lumpy and, 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 and slow. Um, so uh, the evolution, even in 10 years to 15 years, uh, has been amazing. And right now, I think you're only going to see um, three or four players who are really lightning quick, and the rest is going to be, everybody's going to be exactly the same level, just because of the type of work they're putting into in, in, in training, your, your core stability, your muscle strength, uh, your your agility, everything has been um, put into this one big um, uh, program that, uh, you know, everybody has to follow it and everybody is only getting better from it. And like you said, there's going to be only the individual skills and the tactics from the teams that are going to separate the uh, the the average player from the best uh, in the world. And, and a little bit of luck and a little bit of fortune can, yeah. can add to that as well. For sure, yeah. Plus, yeah. Plus, sorry, sorry, Adrian. Plus, yeah. plus, I think the, ment the mental state of the game has also evolved. Um, I, know, I know quite a few uh, teams working with, uh, with psychologists and, and uh, individual players who need extras. They do it as well. It's just because, well, you, you're not only playing in a stadium full of, uh, let's say, 50 to uh, 70,000 people. You, uh, you're actually entertaining uh, the idea of... Uh, playing in front of a, a billion people who are watching you on the screen all over the world. So um, some people don't care. Some people actually like the challenge, but some people actually do, uh, you know, get nervous and, and, and get paranoid about, Ooh, what if I'm going to play bad? What if this is not going to work for me? What this and what that? And this is where the psychology of the, of the game comes in handy as well. Sure. And uh, like you said, uh, you, you, you need to um, you need to start to develop your, the players from young age, make them aware of this, and make 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 sure that they're not going to be afraid of of the challenges ahead. Mm -hmm. And this is where you know the good players uh, will be separated from the great ones as well, the ones who don't really care about uh, whoever is watching. They just want to play the game and enjoy. Yeah, and so yeah, so to that point, that's a nice transition. So maybe if you could talk to us a little bit about. Um, your role kind of Atticus group and along with you know being out there and talking to clubs and talking to players you're also taking on a role as a mentor and with young professionals maybe tell us a little bit about what you're doing kind of what that process looks like and kind of what's the what's the goal of your role uh, with uh, with Atticus all right well uh, as we know the social media at this moment is is, is a big part of, uh, of anybody's life you know we're doing this podcast right now um, mm -hmm. because there is a, there's a big presence uh, on social media. So um, the players that we have signed at Atticus, and uh, I, I am trying to be there for them just to ensure that they don't make any stupid mistakes, that, uh, that you know, young boys uh, 
well, do. I mean, this is the human nature. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, instead of posting some, some stupid stuff on the Instagram or, you know, Facebooks and whatever, um, I'm just trying to make sure that the information that they are putting out there for the fans and also for the friends, but, uh, you know, for the people, for the future uh, sport directors and, and the coaches that might be working with them, that, um, you know, they stay neutral in whatever they try to uh, bring over to uh, as a message. It's, it's, it's quite, easy to, um, quite easy to blame everybody and, and, you know, point fingers at the left and right. It's never my fault. It's his fault. And, you know, but in the long, long term, you, um, you're responsible for your own actions. And if you make a mistake today, it might actually haunt you within five to ten years later down the road. Um, so I'm just trying to make sure that the Facebooks and the Instagrams that they stay clear and as clean as possible. I mean, they still have their own lives, the players, and they they they, they need to express themselves as well. But uh, do it do it privately, do it to face to face to people, but don't spread it out in the open. I think it's a very very important message to those young boys. Um, secondly, also um, when um, you know, they, they have the games. I do analyze the games from time to time if it's necessary because sometimes they will come, the players, they will come and say, I don't feel it. I don't feel confident. I'm doing something wrong. I can't score a goal or my passes don't come out. So this is this is where I come in actually as well. Um, I will look at the games. I will analyze it myself and actually um, try to pinpoint what's happening and why. Um, are those mistakes being made or why you're not feeling so confident? Uh, it's, um, again, it's a process that it's not as straightforward since I'm not the coach of them and, and all the tactics uh, on the pitch, they are still you know, decided by the head coach. I'm there just to make sure that uh, he is just going to go and relax again. Um, every single player that we sign in our Edaticus knows how to play football. They are really top professionals as well. So we just have to make sure that they can perform to the best of abilities at the end of the day on the weekend, you know? Yeah. And that's what matters, you know, the weekend goals, the weekend passes, the weekend statistics. This is what matters and the rest... Um, do your training at home or if, uh, if we have a striker that lacks confidence in front of the goal, I will take him uh, into a private training session with, uh, with obviously the knowledge of the club and, and uh, the club has to agree with it. We, we wouldn't do it and, you know, we work with, uh, very tightly with the clubs. So if they let me take the player for an individual session of an hour or 45 minutes just to get his confidence back up, I will do that gladly and I'm going to show him a few tricks down the road as well just to make sure that this season he's going to score 16 goals instead of 10. Yeah. Well, and then yeah, and you talk about kind of the confidence or anxiety and then obviously you started on, on social media. I'd be interested in your take because I think I've often wondered and I've watched some kids that they're so worried about posting stuff online. Um, they're very demonstrative in their actions because they believe everybody's watching all the time. And so with that comes anxiety and pressure. And like, do you think with that, like thinking about your, your time as a player and now players today, do you think that the pressure the kids have today is greater, that that's real, that um, they have to engage more tools to manage all that because more eyeballs are watching? Um. I think so, yes. I, I don't think we had the pressure of the social media at my time, you know. Um, the mobile phone area uh, era just started just around the, uh, you know, uh, time where you could take pictures with your telephone started some sometime around 2000, I'm guessing. And the quality was so low, even if you wanted to post it somewhere. Um, yeah. There was no place like that because Facebook didn't exist back then anyway. So the only thing you could do is maybe uh, take a video of somebody with a 0.3 megapixel camera that <laughs> nobody, nobody could actually make out uh, what it was. So um, we, we didn't have that care that if we do go out and do something stupid outside the football pitch, um, that it's going to haunt us. Now, right now... Uh, Anything you do wrong, I mean, you there's people uh, with 17 or 20 phones at the spot and 
recording it and it just you know goes viral so quickly so um, from that point of view um, definitely yes but I think it's also a positive impact on the on, on the players because then they know uh, they're being watched everywhere and all the time which is going to keep them calm as well and, and they're not going to do stupid things they're going to concentrate on the on, on the careers if this is their main goal because uh, then you're not going to go out, you're not going to go out drinking, you're not going to go out partying, you're just going to focus on the 15 years of your professional career that are uh, left in your life. And then when you finish with your football, then you can do whatever you want because you've done it. So I would say it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a win-win um, and it's a maybe and maybe not situation where I would say... Um, don't do stupid things, just concentrate on your football and you'll be just fine. You don't have to worry about the social media and just concentrate, make you, make you legs, make you feet, make you mind um, talk for you. And then people will look at you with different eyes. They're going to say, oh, this guy is really smart because he's taking care of his body. Mm -hmm. He's not going out. He's not going drinking. He is just focusing on the football. And this is something that actually the sporting directors and the coaches, they are looking for in, in, in players, you know, the quiet ones, the ones who do the job the, the right way. And, and, and that's it. And uh, at the end of the day, on a weekend, when you win, whether it's 1-0 or 10-0, you know, <laughs> You're just as happy uh, because you won, and, and everybody's everybody's happy. Yeah, and then it's it's you know thinking back to what you're saying with Brian McBride and and his habits and kind of how he approached the game. Now seeing some of the young players that are coming coming to you and are part of your roster, um, do you feel like more or less of them have those kinds of tools and habits than when you play? Like, are they? Is there a better, is there greater awareness? Do they come with better habits? Um, or is there, because I'm always, I always wonder, and even the young players we work with, I feel like it's a bit of both where I find you have some kids with habits that I just blow my mind in regards to the quality of what they bring um, and something that I had never seen when I was a young person. And, but then you have others who, there is a, also this other level of relative or just a big gap of maturity around where they are. And so, what, would you see more on both ends of the spectrum and kind of, of the kids coming in and you have to do more work to kind of bring them along and help them mature? Like, curious what you see. No, I, I think I see way more mature uh, players at this time. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I think also the professionalism of, uh, of, of building uh, their careers starts at the age of, um, well, here in Belgium starts at the age of six, actually, you know, you can, you can go and start playing and then, uh, at the age of 10, you're being scouted by the best teams in, in, in Belgium and, and the selection is being made already. You're kind of um, uh, having the best coaches available for you from a very young age. So uh, by the time you, let's say, 18, you've been probably training already with the first teams um, from that particular club as well, just to get the experience. And, and for the lucky few, they, uh, they already played games uh, for that club as well. But... Mm -hmm. What I see is really, it's uh, at, at the age of 18, 20, the guys are way more mature than, than let's say, we used to be um, 20, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, they know what's at stake uh, because um, not only of, uh, of the training, I think they, they, they also play lots of more video games. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, um, you're, uh, you know, and what they're seeing on a computer screen from your PlayStations and your Xboxes, I think they want to re replicate it as well on the football pitch. Mm. And uh, the uh, the more obsessing uh, players, uh, they will actually master those skills as well, um, which is not necessarily helpful on a football pitch, since the game has evolved into such a speed where you don't really have the time to to do you you know flip over backwards or or whatever. <laughs> Yeah. But it's, it's a good skill to have because at some situations, let's say once every few games, you could actually use it and, and stand out because of that to potential uh, teams that have been uh, trying to scout you. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't see anybody at the age of 20 anymore who you would say, oh, he's still a kid. Um, yeah. They are... Uh, at the age of 18, they're very mature. They talk mature. They they uh, they're getting their uh, the media trainings as well uh, at most of the clubs. You know the the, the professional clubs, the first division clubs. Mm -hmm. So they know how to behave. You're gonna have your uh, 
one out of the hundred. You're gonna, you, you're sure. still gonna have somebody who, uh, who is gonna do stupid things. But uh, then you're just hoping that uh, whatever they're gonna do, it's gonna be in a private um, uh, environment where they can actually control what's going out, and when and how. And um, and this is also something that uh, a few of the players we're just trying to to educate. If you want to go out, do it privately. You know, take the party to you rather than bring it out in the open where everybody's going to point your phone at you. So, and, and they do listen, you know, it's a generation that actually does listen. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes too much, if you ask me, because it's, uh, <laughs> I, I sometimes miss the, cra miss the crazy players that have the special skill and something, they do something unexpected mm -hmm. on a pitch. Right. Um, I, I don't see it as much um, as I used to um, mm -hmm. on pitches because everybody has been obviously trained to a level where, you know, I only dream, I, I would only dream of actually having the skills uh, of a 16 year old, 18 year old right now during my career back then, you know? Yeah. So um, every, everything is being handed to, to the best players anyways. Um, to most of the clubs in the, in the high divisions, they, you know, the nutritionists, the, the physical coaches, they know what they're doing. And, and they, the, the only thing that the players have to do right now is really perform. And, use the body in the best possible way to actually achieve their ultimate goal, which is playing for the national team of your own country, uh, playing the Champions League for your club. Um, so I don't know about the pressure. I don't think so. I think they have many tools right there and ready. Um, it's The pressure is, am I going to use it as a player or am I just going to laugh at it and then regret it when my career is finished and I haven't done it? Yeah. So. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I wanted to dig in a bit on, you know, talking about those special moments and, and also like your reference as well to, to PlayStation and Xbox and all the data. I, I think one of the things for us in working with young players and talking to some others as well, you're right, like the level is so high and the ability for kids to play off of both feet, their ability to, to play in and understand space and how their, their qual overall quality has grown. And I feel like part of the crutch or the challenge that's come with that is everybody is focused on or so many players i want to be really great at everything or i want to be really really good at every facet of the game and then what you're just saying there is you know but the players who are impact the players who have moments of quality do that one special special thing better than anybody else and so i'd be interested to, as you bring players into your into your group and you work with them how much of it is about I'm going to dig deep and spend the time and all the details on that one thing that makes me special. It's less about spending my 90 minutes a day on all facets of the game and continue to improve everything. Or on the other side of it, I'm going to focus on improving a weakness. You know, instead of that, I'm going to dig deep on, I'm a finisher and I'm going to finish in this area. I need work here, whatever it might be. I, I had this great, I heard this great advice from a co Academy coach once that said, you know, as you think about your pathway, make a decision and dig deep on, are you a goal scorer, are you a goal creator, or your goal stopper, and be that. Um, and so interested in how you approach it with players and them getting noticed for the first time and getting that contract, and then when they have that opportunity, being able to go to the next level. How do you talk to them about that? Well, obviously, uh, the um, um, bringing the players on at this point point in time is not as, as, as simple as, uh, as just, you know, uh, bring them in because uh, um, the rules have changed and it's quite difficult to, to approach anybody um, under the age of 18 without, you know, getting penalized for it, mm -hmm. um, uh, I guess. So we, uh, we're always looking for players that have, uh, have their maturity and they are already 18. So that means they have already achieved a certain level of something. All right. right. Um, now, What's happening also, if there's going to be a player that we want to bring in, is just because one of us, uh, we have a group of five, um, five people working in our football department at Atticus, that one of us has seen something special mm. in that player. Yeah. Um, so whether it's going to be this uh, beautiful long pass of uh, 50 yards, you know, right on the nose of the striker, or whether or not it's a good finisher, or whether or not somebody's really fast, or really, um, really skillful. You know, there's, there's always going to be that one thing that attracted me or my colleagues to this one particular player. Otherwise, you know, there's, there, there is enough um, football players in this world, and, and that's 
are just football players. You know, whether or not they're going to go play their whole careers and you never hear of them, it's just because they are just there as a normal football player. They've made it to the highest division, but you never heard of them just because they have not had something that was different or that more special than the other ones had. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it is something you cannot work on, unfortunately. I mean, um, unless um, your goal scoring ability, um, um, you know, Mbappé, 19-year-old, he can score from any angle with left and right. It doesn't matter. Um, it, he's definitely working on it every day. But on top of that, he's as fast as anybody that you know in football. So mm -hmm. he's got already two attributes, and that's why everybody knows Mbappé. Mm -hmm. It's the same with um, with uh, Salah from, from Liverpool, you know. he uh, When he was at Chelsea, you know, nobody was really talking about him because he didn't score enough. And... He was fast enough, but he maybe didn't believe that he was fast enough. So this is the uh, this is something that the coaching staff right now at Liverpool, I think they made him believe and aware that he is actually the fastest guy in the Premier League, together with Sadio Mane along his side. Yeah. And those two are the fastest guys in, in, in the Premier League. The long story short is, if maybe there was a different coach at Liverpool right now, maybe those two have not realized that they are the fastest and they would not use it as much, which means you and I, we would not see it on the telly and we, you and I, we, we would not really think that they are as good as they are. Mm -hmm. It's, um, um, you know, so things that you can improve um, physically, um, like, you know, scoring goals and your speed, yes, you can work on it. Some, some things like the skills from Paul Gascoigne that we've mentioned before, mm -hmm. well, those you cannot teach. I mean, those you just cannot teach. Or you have it or you don't. But um, yeah, you speed, uh, you definitely can work on it because uh, I know I have in my career, um, mm -hmm. although I was very fast from the line, like, you know, the first five to 10 yards, I don't think you would find uh, two or three players in the Premier League that would be faster. Now, just because of my short stature, I would be losing that speed along the way. So uh, going 30 yards, 40 yards, 50 yards, uh, that advantage would diminish. And uh, right. you know, 10 years later in the Premier League, um, that was not an advantage at all because all the other players caught up to me. Mm -hmm. So I had to do something new again and I had to start um, working towards uh, retaining my speed that I've actually you know, um, gained the first five yards. I needed to retain it to you know, stay way ahead of the competition. and. and there are ways of training for that, uh, as simple as that. So uh, if you have the right people around you, if you have the right coaching staff, the right nutritionists, uh, the right um, you know, food that you intake and the, and the right amount of training in a week, then you definitely can improve on those special skills that you already have. And mm -hmm. then the, the, the just average skills that you have, just make sure that they don't go forgotten and, and, and just keep on working on them as well because... Uh, if you're standing still and you're not learning um, every day, every week, then you're going backwards. It's uh, it's as simple as that because the next guy behind you, he's going to want to take your place. So stay on your toes and, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, make you make you strong. Uh, strong qualities make him stronger and the weaker ones just definitely work on them so you don't uh, fall into this, uh, this tunnel where everybody's going to say, oh my God, his left foot sucks. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, and it's interesting you say the Salah example is a good one where, you know, because you said earlier too, around a little bit of luck and a bit of timing. And that that's a that plays a big part in that as well, right? And uh it'd be interesting. And you talk about confidence or you know what Salah may or may not believe about what he's capable of. Um and part of that too is bravery, where can you can you own that yourself um and kind of take a risk? And so I'd be interested in that in working with young players like how would you how would you divine kind of bravery and kind of how are kind of the tools of bravery uh with four kids today and how important is that i think it's part of your character anyways i mean will i take the risk do i have the <laughs> pardon me the the language but do you have the balls to actually take the risk sure. um and third of all are you um are you going to listen to everything the coach is saying or are you just going to go your own way from time to time? Because, you know, we, we have young players um, that uh, I, 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 
without naming names or, or clubs, um, he's coming to me and telling me that I'm, why are you not shooting anymore from long distance? I mean, you used to do that. You have your shot that, you know, from 20, 30, 25 yards. You have a, such a tremendous shot. If you only score two to three goals from that distance for your club, I mean, everybody's going to remember you. But you don't do it anymore. And you used to do it, yes. And he's telling me, well, I'm really sorry, but my, my coach, he told me I cannot do it. So it's kind of counterproductive. Um, this measure because if you know that somebody and you've seen that somebody scoring goals uh, and they were not lucky goals they were really nice goals and prepared goals from 20 to 25 yards and then you actually cutting off his wings um, what do you do as a player I mean you have to listen to your your coach because he's the one who is going to put you next week yeah. um, so do you have the balls of actually showing to him that I will take that shot from 20 yards and it might result in a goal, or you're going to take a shot, you're going to shank it completely, it's going to go somewhere in the stands on the left side, and then the coach is going to say, see, I told you not to shoot, you're benched, you're not coming in anymore. So there's going to be one of those uh, moments in your life where you're going to have to decide for yourself whether am I the risk taker, or am I going to just, and I'm going to be special, or I'm just going to be somebody who is going to, you know, follow the crowd. Uh, mm. Again, both... I think both parts are right. Now you're going to have to decide for yourself which is the right for you. Mm. Um, you know, if you're always going to do everything that the coach is asking you, you've done your job and it's perfect, you know, so um, why do anything else? Uh, but if you're not going to score you two or three goals per season from 20 yards, you might not get your dream transfer to Liverpool or to, mm. you know, Chelsea's or whatever your dream might be. So um, I, th I think it's, I, it's, it's, it's a funny one. It's a, it's a very difficult one to explain um, and to judge for you. I think it's, it's, it's going to be uh, anybody's uh, day. And you know, if you feel good and you feel confident, just go for it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think, as you said, a lot of that, because bravery can manifest itself in very, very different ways. And it is understanding yourself. Like, what am I and who am I as a player? And, and what am I comfortable being um, and, and be that? Right. Whatever that if, if I'm the guy, if I'm Mr. Consistent and that's who I am and that's what I'm about, then be that. Um, yeah. So I know we've talked. Yeah. And we've talked before about the data. Like I'd be interested in that because I know the data around details, the data now in regards to how players are evaluated and how they get opportunities is vitally important. And there's numbers about everything now. Um, how do you talk to the young players about that? And, you know, you know, everybody's just trying to accumulate numbers. Is it quantity versus quality? You know, how do I stand out, not just in the flash or what makes me special, but how do I stand out on that, on the screen or on the piece of paper that's, you know, handed to a, a scouting staff or a coaching staff? Yeah, it is, it is interesting because we know, we know that quite a few teams, well, almost all the teams right now, they, the, the first, um, the first, um, direction how they will select a player for the team is not by watching um, games it's not by sending scouts to actually see a guy it's actually going to your statistical uh, websites and pull all of those out and if they um, match more or less with the perfect idea of um, of a club of a coach then the next step will be sending scouts and actually looking at his behavior on the pitch um, and the quality that you actually present. So statistics are becoming more and more important in, in, in soccer. Um, it, it was not like this 20 years ago, but obviously everything is evolving right now. Um, 20 to 25 years ago, uh, it was the feel, the gut feel, and actually the scouting part would get you the players um, to, uh, to your team. Right now, it's pretty much all about statistics. So, um, but we as a, as a group of articles, we're not really trying to, uh, to push our players to play for the statistics because um, I think it defeats the purpose of them expressing themselves uh, on a football pitch. You know, if you, uh, if you don't feel comfortable with, with giving a long pass or giving a pass to the front, don't do it just so your statistics look right, you know. Um, if, you, if you can give a good pass to the side or backwards or if you can give a good cross or don't give a good cross, you know, give to somebody else, 
in a better position, then you should do that. But, um, you know, statistics are very nice. But then again, um, somebody who, uh, who crossed 50 times during the, during the game, you know, he's going to stand out by far because, well, first of all, he touched the ball 50 times. And second of all, he, um, he crossed 50 times. But if from those 50 crosses, all of them were kind of going on the ground and never really hit anywhere your, um, um, the player that was intended to, then those statistics are useless. So uh, this is where we are still, uh, at Attic is working on the old, old fashioned um, way where we want to see the player in action. We don't care about the statistic as much at this point. Um, obviously we're not, a, we're not a club, we're not a team, we're not somebody who needs to acquire um, the services of a certain player. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, I, I I like to go to trainings and I like to go to games and I like to just see it for myself. And the training sessions, believe it or not, for me is the most important factor in actually uh, choosing a player, not mm -hmm. the games, because you can have a wonderful game and a week later you can have another wonderful game. And then during the whole week, you just don't do absolutely nothing. So it will show me your character at the game, at the training, whether or not you're a fighter, you actually want to do something for your football, you want to improve, or just somebody who will reach a certain level on the weekend uh, and never progress. So for me, it's going to be a very important factor that, uh, you know, the touchy feely and the, and, and the talk, the talking with the player and actually seeing how he reacts and, and what he's doing uh, during the training sessions rather than during the games. Yeah. It's a little bit of a different approach. You know, um, this is what I've done back in the day when I was a sport director here at Lears uh, for two years. Yeah. Um, it was the videos in the first place because obviously I couldn't be everywhere the same place, but then they would be invited for a, uh, for a trial or I would go and scout, but I wouldn't go to scout a game. I would actually go and scout a training session because for me that was more important seeing whether or not you actually are dedicated to your job uh, not only when it matters on Saturday but during the whole week yeah and to argue when it and on the training ground is when it matters most because if you're gonna execute it on the weekend that's when it's gonna happen right yes, um, exactly. um, that's great and and so kind of before we before we wrap up uh, I'm gonna hit you with three quick questions so what okay. we're what we've been doing at the end of every podcast is um, giving you an opportunity to talk to yourself as a teenager. So we're gonna, I'm gonna ask you three questions and you're talking to Thomas at 13, okay? And so I wanna, I'm curious what, you, what would you say to yourself uh, then, all right? So first one, uh, as a teenager, you're probably afraid or embarrassed to try new things, but trust me, you should really do this. What do you think young Thomas should do? Well, young Thomas at 13 was not really too shy or too embarrassed to do uh, try anything. Okay. Um, um, what would have taken you out of your comfort zone? You thought maybe I um, maybe should have tried that. Yeah. Okay. Um, we still we still staying in football, right? <laughs> you can go any you can go anywhere anywhere you like. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I my 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 life motto was um, just try anything once whether or not it's going to work for you or not, um, just go and do it. And if it, if it doesn't work, it's something you feel uncomfortable with, then, then just don't do it. Just leave it alone. So I, um, I spent my, 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 my career, my football life in a way uh, that I, I do not have many regrets. So mm -hmm. I would say to myself at 13, just, just go out and do what you've done already because um, – in, in the football world, you have not done too many mistakes. I mean, there's going to be here and there, uh, there a little bit of a, of, of a problem and maybe a discussion, but I would say um, maybe um, try to, um, Thomas at 13, try to go and have more training with your left and your right foot mm -hmm. and your head to score more goals and believe that any chance in every situation in front of a goal is a goal. Don't be satisfied with four chances and one goal. Be satisfied when you make 50 to 80% conversion of your chances. Okay, all right, great. Um, okay, number two. Um, do this at the start of every day. Drink water. Okay. Um, it's very strange, but I think, <laughs> I, I cannot stress enough that uh, Forget your energy drinks and your 
supplements and whatever. Drink water because the more water you drink during the day, the better your body is going to feel, the better your brain is going to work. Um, so the moment you wake up, you have a bottle of water right next to your bed, just drink it all. Drink the whole half a gallon, yeah. whatever, just drink it and mm. drink as much as possible during the whole day. Not only in the morning, just, you know, um, for me, it's, it's roughly even right now, it's about a gallon of water a day, which is what, four liters, depends on where you're coming from. Yeah. Um, just do it. It's healthy, helps your brain work better, and you're going to feel better, and your body's going to thank you for it. Yeah, it's funny how much that's changed. No one even talked about that when, when we were 13. That wasn't even a conversation. Um, well, amazing they told, stuff. Us to, they told us not to drink Coke and stay away from air conditioning, but never said uh, don't drink Coke. <laughs> right, yeah, lots of milk. Drink a lot of milk. That was the, that was the big thing. Then. Yeah, but that's not right anymore. <laughs> no, definitely not. Um, okay, last one. Um, Thomas, take seriously this advice so maybe some advice somebody gave you you maybe didn't take it serious enough what what might that be oh um that's a good one but uh, one that i didn't take yeah um well again i'm i'm, I'm gonna be I'm, I'm gonna be pointing at you right now saying that i've, I've lots of advice that i've gotten in my life i've actually taken and whether mm -hmm. or not it worked for me in the long run um you know, you always, you always think, especially when there's older guys uh, talking to you, especially football players, if they give an advice, you actually do listen. Mm -hmm. um, maybe the one advice that I should have um, uh, taken was um, at a certain moment living in Canada and playing, playing in Canada uh, at the age of 17, um, I moved for the winter time. I moved to a, uh, to a club in Germany just to uh, bridge that gap. Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody told me, well, don't go back. What's the point of going back? I mean, you can continue your football career right now from Germany. And that club was in the second division at the moment. It was uh, Fauerfeld Osnabrück. And um, I felt that I was too young. I felt like at the age of 17, almost eight, no, sorry, I was 18 already at that time. I thought I was too young and I wasn't ready for it. And um, I think this is the one advice that I would have maybe... Um, Change my part of my career when when those two extra years playing in Europe would have made me um, maybe reach for other goals, yeah. and I haven't taken that. I went back to Canada. I still played two years in the CSL, and only then I decided. Well, now I'm old enough to go. So yeah. um, if, if there is an opportunity for you to go somewhere, uh, then yes, the only thing you can do is fail. I mean, sure. if it works, if it if it works out. Um, then you've done it and, 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 and you took a chance and so just just do it, you know? Yeah. And I didn't take it at the age of 18 because I felt I wasn't ready. So um, I would do it now. <laughs> yeah, no, and I think, I think that's good advice for all of young people too is, you know, it's, we say a lot now too, everything matters, but nothing matters very much. And so when you're young and you're free and you have a chance to try or take a risk on something, you know, what's the worst thing that can happen? I might learn something. You know, exactly. You, yeah. might, you might miss a few extra weeks of school as well, uh, yeah. which I wasn't thinking about that time, but I should have yeah. done it. Well, we're in, a, uh, we're in a moment now where lots of schools being missed. Uh, it's online. I don't know Yeah, how that's yeah. going. I'm sure you're having your own challenges at home with the girls. but uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. We well, girls, uh, we, we're doing this homeschooling right now. So it's, it's fun as well because it gives us more quality time at home. So it's, it's good, you know. I hope everybody's safe and, and you know, it stays safe anyways and just don't do stupid things and we're going to get rid of Corona. We're going to be back on a football pitch before you know it. So everybody hopes for that anyways. For sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah and with that, no, and all the best to you and your family. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for taking the time today. Oh, you're welcome. No problem. Anytime. Man. For sure. Yeah.